And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're receiving this information. My name is Rafael Vasquez Guzman, and this is your show, Líderes del Futuro. Today, I have the privilege and opportunity to have Reverend Lindsay Bell Kerr, who is joining us to have a conversation. A lot of us are suffering from, um, you know, depression and anxiety. A lot of us went through trauma when we were growing up that we've never even acknowledged or have been able to process. And so with COVID, the fires and everything else, we've been dealing with a lot of this and we are not talking to other individuals. We may not even know that there may be services out there to support people. And so I'm grateful, uh, Reverend, for taking the time and being with us uh, today. And I'm just interested in your perspective, your point of view on, you know, what are you seeing out there? And then of course, what recommendations do we have for our community? Rafael, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, I I concur uh, with what I'm hearing from you that there's a lot of anxiety and depression in our community right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of that stems from what we would consider overlapping traumas, right? So people carry around their own trauma. Frequently, it's it's trauma from childhood, trauma mm -hmm. from relationships, trauma from family systems. And then you, you sort of add on to it, right? So for many of us in this community, there was the, the trauma of um, the, the killing of Andy Lopez mm -hmm. in, in 2013. Mm -hmm. And then, so we feel unsafe in our community, right? And then you add on fire season and fire season and fire season, right? You keep adding on um, this trauma and then you, you add in now COVID and being distanced from each other. And then many of uh, the people I know in our community are struggling to find stable housing. That's traumatic to be mm -hmm. displaced from your home. Um, and it just keeps adding, adding up. And for me, at least in my life, I feel like I haven't really had the time to sit back and reflect on some of the traumas I've experienced in the last few years. Um, and so I'm just carrying around that, that anxiety in me. Um, that's true for many of us, right? And and it just as it as it keeps adding up and we don't process it, it, it compounds and becomes even even bigger in our in our mindset and our worldview. Yeah. Yeah. I always go back to this idea of um, Robert Blythe, Robert Blythe. And, and I talk about this on my show all the time. Robert Blythe said that the reason why you have a difficult time putting a child to bed at 10 p.m. and at 11 p.m. sometimes when they're babies, right, like they're maybe two and three year olds and they're jumping off the couch and they and you're like, please go to sleep. And it's because when we are at that age, you know, we have this, uh, this bag that we carry mm -hmm. and that bag is empty. There's no worries. You're being provided hopefully with food and clothing and a safe space and, and loving family members. And as we grow up is this idea of the many traumas that you describe mm -hmm. to the point that when we are 18 and 19, sometimes 20, we can barely wake up in the morning. We are so tired throughout the day. So we are so frustrated with everything because by then that bag is so full that you dragging it around. So you don't have the energy to be jumping around and playing until midnight. Um, and I think that that is exactly what you're describing. This idea that many of us, we had our, our childhood traumas. And then as you clearly said, especially for people of color in Sonoma County uh, to know that um, Andy Lopez was killed and people protested and everything else. And yet, you know, for many community members, there was no justice in general. It created this gap, this uh, distance between law enforcement and the community in general. Youth specifically have been feeling for many years now that they you know, they cannot trust the police officers who are supposed to be there to protect them. Um, and then, you know, this whole thing with the fires and everything else. And now we are on uh, the third year of COVID and the question of when is it going to end, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the first thing that for me is really important is to acknowledge it. Uh, you know, when I said we are all dealing with anxiety, we're all dealing with depression. I think it's important for all of us, including myself, to acknowledge that that is my reality. There is a, a certain level of anxiety. There is a certain level of depression. Um, and how do we cope? That's mm -hmm. my question to you. How is mm -hmm. it that 
we can all uh, be supportive of each other and succeed. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned Robert um, Blythe because I think uh, so often for me, uh, finding a way to cope is first finding a way to acknowledge what's really happening to me, right? So like we stay, we say in 12 step, the first step is admitting you have a problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I loved your, your alluding to, to childhood, right? Because when it's actually a psychological state as children where you can't, um, you can't imagine that your parents are fallible because you're so dependent on them. How could, you know, they need yeah. to be able to take care of you. I feel like the, the, that growing up and, and sometimes for some of us experiencing the fallibility of our parents, um, for others of us thinking about other people who are supposed to take care of us, mm -hmm. police officers, yeah. like finding out that not only do they not take care of us, but actually there's a problem with the entire system of how mm -hmm. it's structured. That acknowledging that and acknowledging that that difficulty and pain and the problem of it is beyond ourselves, right? Like it's, it's so much bigger than me. Mm -hmm. That's the first step for me mm -hmm. because sometimes I just carry this anxiety inside of me and I think it's, it's entirely um, my problem to solve. And when I remember how big the problems are that we're facing, then it, it helps me get perspective and think about how I can be part of a solution and part of working for justice, but I am not solely responsible for making this change, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's also especially true with, with something like fire season. Um, you know, climate justice is something we all need to be turning our attention to. Mm -hmm. um, and also fires are going to continue to happen. So part of, of dealing with that anxiety for me is just thinking about what are the steps that, that I can take right now towards hopefully keeping myself and my loved ones safe. And what are the steps I can be taking to keeping my, my wider community safe, mm -hmm. right? So, so remembering that I'm, I'm not actually in this alone is, is a huge step. Um, the pandemic has made that work so much harder. Mm -hmm. I think there is the part of being physically isolated from each other. Like there's nothing like being in the same space as someone. Um, but even with, especially some of the younger people I know, even as it's become maybe more safer for us to be together in person, that anxiety has sort of manifested itself in social anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for people to, to reach out. Um, those, for those people, particularly young people who are struggling with that, I, I really encourage them to, to reach out in whatever small way that they can. So maybe it's too, they're too anxious to think about calling someone or showing up. You know, they know how to text, right? Text, text, a fr like just check in with each other mm -hmm. in the basic ways that you can. Um, that for me is often like just a first step in, in re right, reaching out as much as you can in the time that you have, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I think you, you brought up something super important and well, two items. One is isolation. Mm -hmm. The fact that we were forced into our spaces, right? And said, you know, stay home as much as possible so that you don't get sick. And as a result of that, we stay not just in our homes, but those who are privileged to have their private space, like their own room, we are seeing youth spending a lot of time in the rooms. And sometimes the only way that they socialize, as you said, may be texting, but it may be video games. And you're just playing video games with all these other individuals, but it's, it's not the same type of connection as we used to have. And yeah, I'm noticing sometimes in restaurants and other spaces, where youth may be, maybe at the park, they may be at a very short distance from each other, but they're not really talking with each other. Mm -hmm. They're texting messages to each other, even mm -hmm. though they are five and 10 feet away. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the invitation has always been for parents to do daily check-ins with their children. I always talk about, you know, if you have three children, take one of your children, leave the other two at home with a responsible adult and go around the block and do a check-in. How's everything going, right? Um, how are your classes? How are your friends? I haven't seen so-and-so in a while. How are they doing? Um, and so this isolation needs, we need to control it. Otherwise, what we are seeing is this social anxiety where we're in the same space, 
but we are not really connecting with each other the way that we used to. In um, Latin America, we always talk about the reason we do handshakes at the beginning of a conversation and at the end of a conversation is at the beginning you're saying, I mean you no harm in whatever interaction we're gonna have, this is where we're gonna be. And at the end is again, we are ending this conversation. I wish you the best. Um, but it's also a way to, you know, we are not even aware of that we're doing this, but it's also a way of sharing energy or borrowing energy, just like hugs. Uh, the Mexica people known as the Aztecs, um, they would talk about, again, the hug, being able to embrace the soul of that other person. They call it apapachar, and it's really to touch somebody's soul. And so when I talk with people about giving each other hugs when appropriate and in a safe manner nowadays, it's really, if you need some energy, I'm willing to share some energy. And if it's okay with you, I'm gonna borrow some energy to get through the rest of my day. And being conscious about it is really, really important. And so, um, again, this uh, social isolation has caused a lot of um, trauma for a lot of youth in our community. And as you clearly said, if the parents are not talking about it, you know, how are children going to even know how to bring up this type of conversations? Absolutely. I think um, one of the things I'm hearing in all of this is this problem with with vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? It's, um, and certainly I'm, um, I don't, you know, it's not my place to, to, to say, you know, how, how parents should, you know, be vulnerable or not. I know we're all, we're all struggling right now. And also I think about um, when I see young people or any people really turning to interacting with social media um, or with video games or um, through text, Right. What they're really doing is that they're they're creating a much more controlled environment in which they can put a um, put only a certain part of themselves mm -hmm. forward. Right. That's so true. What we see on social media. Right. I'm going to put forward like the best part of myself. I'm going to take yep. a picture where I look nice or whatever. Right. And on text message, I have the opportunity to really think through every word I'm going to mm -hmm. say to you. Right. In live conversation. I might say something I regret, or I might slip up, or I might sound silly, or you, you might not like what I said, right? I think really it's, it, it's we're out of practice with mm -hmm. how to be vulnerable and open. Um, and because we feel so maybe anxious right now, it, it's difficult to take that risk mm -hmm. to really put our full selves out there. Un unfortunately, I think it has a, far from being like a, a salve that's helping us, it's actually making the problem worse, yep. right? Because then all we're seeing from other people is, is their most perfect self, right? We're not seeing that they're flawed too. Um, and especially with the medium of video games, so many of the games that I see um, young people, particularly young men playing are really violent. It's these yep. first person shooter games and it's not, um, that's the filter through which they're seeing the world, either as someone who is perpetuating violence or or having violence visited on them, mm -hmm. right? And what I'm I'm hearing you say instead is this idea of vulnerability and also um, blessing, right? Like sharing. Yeah. Uh, that's the, the 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 I guess the Christian language around understanding, sharing the air um, with each other and sharing mm -hmm. spirit with each other, um, and and to show up and be vulnerable with each other is like an act of courage for me and it's it's also an act of blessing because that's how we that's how we build that's how we build these relationships right and so for many of us right now the the act of vulnerability is to show up and just say hey you know what everything's not great with me um i'm really sad today i'm really anxious today i don't feel good about myself today <laughs> um and and so often when i see people do that other people just relax, right? Because yeah. now they feel like they can be vulnerable too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is extremely powerful. We as a society, at least in this country, and I'm doing somewhat of a generalization, of course, but I think that we are pressured in this society to always put that 
better face of, oh, everything is fine. Uh, you know, I, I always discuss that at my regular career at Santa Rosa Junior College, once in a while, pre-COVID, I would put my colleagues to the test. And, you know, we are so used to, hey, good morning, how are you? And you just keep on walking. Oh, I'm fine. How are you? Okay, I'm good. Okay, bye. And once in a while, I would try this where a colleague would just be on their way to whatever they're going. And like, mm -hmm. hey, how are you? It's like, well, actually, now that you ask, you know, it hasn't been really good. And my day was is going fine, but it was just to let them know, look, this facade that we put on is not a healthy way of doing things. And then they would be kind of in shock. Oh, um, like, you know, it's important. Don't just ask and think that we are just going to go through the, the steps and everybody's going to go on their way. We need to be more vulnerable and open up to each other uh, in order to develop healthy relationships with each other. And I think that often parents and teachers and administrators at different places, doctors and everybody else are just expected to put on that smile and say, everything is fine. And that's why we are seeing right in the Latinx community, specifically in Sonoma County, the report says the uh, life expectancy is now 2.1 years less than it used to be pre-COVID. Um, the number of people who have died as a result of drug use has um, you know gone up by 200%. And the latest numbers on suicide has, hasn't even come up, but it's obviously really, really bad. And so again, I think it all starts with this point that you just made about being vulnerable and being able to say, you know what, I'm actually not doing okay. Yeah. Can we talk for a minute? And by, yeah. by having that leadership and saying, you know, I'm not doing okay. Then as you clearly said, other people will, oh, okay, I don't have to pretend anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's talk about it. Let's give each other a hug. Let's just, sometimes just talking about it, right? Because again, we are seeing a huge increase in drug use, alcohol use, domestic violence, and child abuse cases. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with this. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. And I think it's really, I loved your sharing about your colleagues sort of rushing off, right? Because I think that's such, that's such a thing that is celebrated and lifted up in the United States mm -hmm. is, is productivity. I would use, yeah. uh, using religious language, my religious language, I would say that is like the false idol mm -hmm. of the United States, right? It's this, it's consumer capitalism. Yep. And so the way you prove your value is by being very productive, right? And so I, I see this, right? I, I see this within family systems where parents are, are killing themselves, working, 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 right? To produce, to provide for the family, right? Mm -hmm. And actually just a few generations ago in the United States, a single earner in the family, yeah. that was enough to provide, right? And, and so the, the terrible game that our, our, our free market, free, using free, yeah. ironically, our free market is doing to us is that it's raising the stakes of how much we have to work to survive and then saying, oh, you're not meeting it. So therefore you're not of value, mm -hmm. right? And this is something that I see, I certainly see with immigrant communities that I work with, but I also see it with generations of, of white folks who have lived in poverty a long time, right? It, bar of what we need to do to produce and be successful gets higher and higher. And so when we don't meet it, um, this capitalist market tells us that we're not of value, mm -hmm. right? No wonder it's difficult then to be vulnerable with each other because this, this terrible system around us is telling us that we are, we are not of worth. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the piece where I think that's really, that's really swimming swimming upstream and, and sort of an act of resistance yeah. almost to be vulnerable and loving to each other. Yeah. 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 And I think that, again, showing that level of affection, appropriate affection mm -hmm. and appropriate vulnerability with our children, yeah. right? Uh, it's so difficult because parents are taught, you know, you're supposed to, as you, as you clearly mentioned, you're supposed to be the perfect parents, whatever that means, right? But you're never supposed to be vulnerable. You're never supposed to cry in front of your children. You're never supposed to anything. And by 
focusing that way and living life that way, the children believe that they too are not supposed to express any type of fault. Absolutely. Otherwise they're a failure and the parents are gonna be disappointed, so on and so forth. And so they go and they isolate in the rooms, they go and talk with their friends perhaps, but often it stays there and it doesn't go anywhere else. And we continue to add into that bag that Robert Blythe talks about. And so from your recommendations, uh, then we're talking about, it's okay to be vulnerable. Yeah. It's okay to express love and affection. I think that uh, with the Latinx community, and I know that in general with men, we're pushing men to, hey, you never show affection, right? Yeah. And I, I have 25 years working with youth and young adults. Some of them now have their own children. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to see because regardless of their age, um, I still tell them that I love them unconditionally, right? And most of my youth are from the Latinx community. And so in their own household to say to each other that you love somebody, especially if you're a male, oh no, this is weird. I don't feel comfortable. And now to see my quote unquote children, right? Uh, in their late twenties with their own children and to see those males express so much love to those boys they often do it with girls, but with boys and telling them that they are beautiful and this and that, it's mm -hmm. so powerful. And I think we need as a society to shift our mentality and openly share those feelings of love. And, and it's, just a, it's no longer just about love, but what I call unconditional love. No matter what, yes. I'll be here for you. And you know what the work that you do in general, uh, as your title suggests, as reverend, is really about teaching people the value of unconditional love. Maybe you can share some of um, how that works from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, right, it begins and it ends, and it's it's all about love. Um, there's a there's a theologian I really like. His name is Henry Nowen, and he was a he was Roman Catholic priest. Um, and as the story goes, he wrote many books. And at some point he had a friend who wasn't Christian who said to him, well, you write all these books, but what would you say to me and my friends? Like, I'm not religious. I don't go to church. What would you say to me is the most important thing? And he said, the most important thing for you to know is that you are beloved. You are, you are beloved by God. You are beloved by me. You are made in love and you are worthy of love it's it's such a radical thing sometimes to say that to people mm -hmm. but that is the the root of all of my work of of letting folks know that they're loved and that they're worthy of love not because of what they do but of of who they are mm -hmm. i think that's that's so that's so true um for everyone, and I'm really glad that you brought up men and people who are, who are sort of raised as men and gendered as men, because I think um, often in my work with, um, with women and girls and also with, with trans women and girls, people who are welcome in those spaces, in those spaces sometimes, um, those more feminine spaces, people can be open about loving and caring for each other. And often in more masculine spaces, we don't make, we don't make room for that, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of that is part of this like capitalist thing, like uh, a man is a value by what he can do, mm -hmm. right? Instead of just being who he is. Um, and also that we, we so frequently violently re remove that sense of belovedness from, from young men, right? Um, I see it sometimes with the way when we shift from little boys being just treated like little children to really mm -hmm. being pulled out that, you know, suddenly if the, the boy doesn't want to um, play sports, but maybe he likes to, to dance or he wants to do music or he reads, right. We just have this, it's like a violence we visit mm -hmm. upon him until he, until he becomes, um, until he becomes someone who's pushed his feelings so far down. Um, I, in my own family system, um, men in my family are, has, there's not been a lot of emotion. Um, growing up, I, 
I think I saw my father cry once. And in the last 10 years or so, a lot has changed for him in large part because um, I came out to my dad as gay and he really had to change his worldview to figure out how to accept and love me. When he, when he opened that up, he, he got to a place where he could really, I think in learning to love me, he also figured out maybe how to love himself a little more. And now he cries all the time. He <laughs> cries more than my mom does. He cries more than I do. It's fine. I mean, my dad's still a man who fixes his car and puts the roof on the house. And, you know, he's still very much who he is, but he's also able to express this, this love um, to other people. He's a much happier person. Mm -hmm. Everyone around him is happier, right? Because as soon as, as soon as, 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 especially as soon as men can find ways to express love and vulnerability, it makes so much room for the rest of us, right? We can yeah. all be open then about, about who we are. So I'm really glad to hear you kind of putting that focus, particularly with men and, and young men. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm reminded of this story of this, of this little girl that described it perfectly. She was seven and she says, you know, somebody asked, why do people cry? And she says, well, imagine a dam, right? And at the top of that dam, there's pockets where people, where water can come out so that the dam is not overwhelmed with pressure yeah. and it'll burst. Your eyes are exactly the equivalent of that dam, right? Where we cry to allow not just happiness, but sadness and anger and everything else out. And I think, again, we have to be more conscious of being able to say, it's okay. If you need to cry, you need to cry, right? Yeah. But instead of holding it in, holding it in, holding it in, and eventually we take it out on the wrong person. That's we, right. you know, we're driving, somebody upsets us. Now we took it to a whole different level. Or again, we medicate with alcohol and drugs and all of that stuff. And so it's really, really uh, powerful that we are trying to, uh, uh, you know, let people know that perhaps COVID is going to be the time where we learn to love ourselves enough to then be able to, to uh, love everybody else for who they are. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, again, seeing more of this. And hopefully this conversation will start other conversations in the households and people will begin the process of being okay with being vulnerable. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think that um, so often um, anger masks sadness. So um, I think that's especially true with men because anger is acceptable for mm -hmm. men. Anger usually isn't acceptable for women, right? Then we say they're yeah. hysterical or they're whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But men can be angry. Um, and so, so often, um, like my dad, when my, uh, when my dad's father, my grandfather, when he, he died, he died in the hospital and my dad received the news and he put his, he put his fist through the wall mm -hmm. in the hospital room. And of course he broke his hand, right? Um, at that moment, he was unable to be sad. Right? The, he had been taught so much, like he can't be sad. So all he can do is anger, mm -hmm. right? And the problem with that is that anger is one of these emotions that you, you almost have to rest it on someone. So right, this is where domestic violence starts. Mm -hmm. This is where abuse starts, mm -hmm. is your anger needs a place to go. And you usually just find the person it's safe to put it on. The beautiful thing about being sad is that it just sort of, it's expansive. You don't need a reason to be sad. Sometimes you just wake up and you're sad. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of reasons just to be sad about the world, right? And if you can just own that, um, and especially if you can cry, right? Scientifically, crying does all sorts of beautiful things for you. It's these hormones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, like you, you, you end up feeling better yeah. after, after crying. So I think like, one of the things for me that I try to practice is, so in my family growing up, um, when I would cry, my parents would tell me, don't cry. Um, they learned that from their parents. Mm -hmm. It's something I'm unlearning and they are too. So in my work, when I encounter someone who's crying, 
what I almost always try to say first is it's okay to cry. This is a good time to cry. Like I'm here with you, cry as much as you need. And that's something really basic that we can just learn to say to each other, right? So when someone does model that vulnerability and crying, just saying to them, hey, this is okay. Like this is good even. And I'm, I'll sit here with you while you cry. And if you want space, I'll do that too. But like, this is, this is okay. And this is actually good that you're allowing yourself to feel these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, yeah it, it's really important again, um, before we ruin the next generation of kids, we really need to have these conversations and we need to have these conversations over and over and over again, uh, where we say, you wanna dress this way, you can dress that way and right, nobody's gonna say no and you wanna cry, you cry. I've only shared this with, um, with very specific, uh, you know, kids that I work with over the years. I think this is the first time I'm going to share it somewhat publicly. But in working with youth, uh, sometimes I was working with 55 uh, youth in different situations and families and so on and so forth. And once a month, the there was so much stuff going on in some of these kids' lives that once a month I would go home, I would go to my room, I would take care of everything and then I would say, okay, I'm going to let it out, right? Yeah. And go to sleep. The next day you wake up and you wake up so rejuvenated and yeah. you're ready for another 50 to 50 kids that you're going to, you know, that this one just got arrested and, and that one is having issues with mom and this one is smoking, whatever the situation was. And again, growing up, I too was told, if you keep crying, I'll give you a reason to cry, cry, right? And the violence that comes with it. And I had to learn yeah. to forgive myself for being vulnerable and accept myself for being vulnerable. And as a result of that, I, I believe, right, that I have taught some of these youth to now be okay with them do the doing that and then teaching their children that it's okay to cry. Because in many of our communities, when a, a, a child falls, they're playing around and they fall and they look around to see if anybody is watching them. And then if they if people are watching, then they start crying. And if nobody's watching, they kind of tough it out, as they say. Um, and to see some of my kids with their kids and say, it's okay, do you wanna come over? And the kid just comes over and starts crying. And it's like, it's okay, tell me where it hurts. Let's take care of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that with teenagers, for me, it's a little bit concerning because if nobody's talking with them, if yeah. nobody's telling them it's okay to do this, then that puts us in a situation where what are they going to do and how are they coping? And again, what I am um, uh, seeing and hearing out there in the community, drug use, alcoholism, um, uh, what is it called, unhealthy sexual relationships and just yeah. violence in general. And so I'm glad that you made some time today to have this conversation. And I look forward to having a follow-up conversation with you um, because this is exactly the type of conversations that I think our community, especially our youth, need to hear um, that it's okay to be vulnerable and that, you know, ultimately, whether we know who's listening, who's watching the video or not, that as a society, there are people that love these children, this youth, mm -hmm. and this adult unconditionally just because these individuals exist yeah right they don't have to do something magical to be loved or amazing just your existence deserves unconditional love so I, I i really appreciate again that you've taken the time today um i don't know if you have any final comments oh no i think i think you wrapped it up right just your existence is enough right and if we can if we can remember, right, that we're loved just for being who we are, right, and remember that we have the capacity to love, mm -hmm. right? So if you are someone who has been loved by other people, you are empowered to love other people, right? Yeah. You can be the one who, who models that vulnerability. And, and for me, in a, in a time that feels really 
kind of crazy and out of control, that's such a source of hope, mm -hmm. right? If I can't do anything else today, I can receive love from other people, I can model vulnerability, and I can love other people in, in return. Definitely. Yeah. Good. Again, I want to thank you for taking the time to those of you who may be listening or watching the video. We want to remind you in case uh, any of this conversation may be triggering to you or in case you want to use it as a resource, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-8255. I always tell people, you know what, write it on a piece of paper, put it on the door of your fridge and right there, you know, because I love you, I want you to have access to this. Text it to family members and say, in case your friends or anybody else needs to talk to somebody confidentially, here's that number. And with that, I wanna thank you, Reverend Lindsay Bell Kerr, for taking the time and being with us here at Lideres del Futuro today on KBBF Bilingual Radio. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>